Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the much anticipated Alumni Reunion 2023. My name is Claudia Hughes, and as the Associate Director of Advancement at the Faculty of Information, I am honored to address you all today. Our team's primary goal is to engage our alumni and supporters to join us in advancing the faculty's mission. And so it fills me with immense pride to bring you today's webinar and showcase some of the exciting and impactful scholarship coming out of our faculty. At the Faculty of Information, we are committed to creating an environment that fosters inclusion, collaboration, and cutting edge research in the information fields. Therefore, I am thrilled to share that the Bissell Building will soon undergo a significant renovation. This transformation will not only revitalize its physical infrastructure, but will also create spaces that inspire and nurture the talents of our diverse community. Through these renovations, we aim to cultivate an atmosphere that embodies the spirit of inclusivity and interdisciplinarity that defines our faculty and spur more of the scholarly excellence, such as you'll hear from today. The renovations will be completed over the next few years in advance of the faculty centenary in 2028. Please allow me now to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Christoph Becker, Director of the Digital Curation Institute at the Faculty of Information. Professor Becker's research focuses on the intersection of information and computer science, and today he will be sharing his expertise in a talk titled, How to Reorient Computing for Just Sustainability, which is based on themes from his upcoming book, Insolvent, to be released on June 6. Moderating this discussion is Professor Matt Ratto, Associate Dean Research and Acting Dean at the Faculty of Information. Professor Ratto's research focuses on how theories and perspectives from techno-science research can usefully extend and contextualize design and engineering practice, particularly related to emerging digital health technologies. I now invite Professor Rado to deliver the land acknowledgement and more formally introduce Professor Becker. I hope that you all enjoy this lecture. Thank you, Claudia, for your kind introduction and a very pleasant afternoon to all of us uh, who are joining this lecture. Um, you see, we got about 27 attendees um, from as far away as Vancouver, I happen to know. Uh, it's my privilege, I'm Matt Ratto, and it's my privilege to represent the faculty as the acting dean and serve as the moderator for today's discussion. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional land where we are gathering today. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Acknowledging the land is an Indigenous protocol used to express gratitude to those who reside here and to honour the Indigenous people who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. It allows us the opportunity to appreciate the unique role and relationship that each of us has with the land and provides a gentle reminder of the broader perspectives that expand our understanding to encompass the long-standing rich history of the land and our privileged role in residing here. It is important for each of us to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on this land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Colonialism is an ongoing current process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. It's also worth noting that acknowledging the land is an Indigenous protocol. Before I introduce today's speaker, um, I want to mention a few technical details of the webinar. Specifically, I'd like to encourage attendees to take advantage of the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. And I'd really like to encourage those of you who have questions to use this feature, the Q&A feature, rather than the chat feature. Um, this Q&A uh, interactive tool provides the perfect avenue for you to submit your questions, and we've allocated specific time at the end of the presentation uh, to uh, have a discussion and to address those questions. So now um, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Professor Christoph Becker. Uh, a, uh, a, a, my, my bio reads an associate professor, but he has actually been recently appointed to full professor at the University of Toronto as of July 1st. Uh, he is uh, a full professor in the Faculty of Information and part also of the School of the Environment at the University of Toronto. He's the director of the Digital Curation Institute, 
and has a background in computer science, informatics, and economics, and he's been here in the faculty since 2013. His research, which has received recognition and funding uh, from various disciplines, spans the fields of computer science, engineering, information science, the social sciences, humanities, and health sciences. And currently, as you will hear directly from him, uh, his research focuses on driving meaningful change in computing to address the pressing needs of sustainability and social justice. Collaborating with experts in human computer interaction, software engineering, science and technology studies, and psychology, his work aims to examine the politics, values, and cognitive processes of design. Uh, develop methods and tools for just sustainability design and design projects that foster equitable and sustainable practices in urban contexts. I also want to note, and I'm sure he will do so as well, Christoph's recent book, Insolvent, How to or Reorient Computing for Just Sustainability, will be launched by MIT Press on June 6th, and I happen to also know is available for pre-order on Amazon, but at a increased cost, it, it appears, and it's possible that uh, Christoph might even give us a discount code if we ask really nicely. Um, I want to actually read to you, and I know he will probably provide more of these, but I want to read to you one specific uh, blurb, uh, back cover blurb, uh, by the distinguished professor at the University of Washington, Amy J. Coe. And this is her comment on this book. And I think it's it's such a great sign of Christoph's work and, um, and I think of the great work uh, more generally at the Faculty of Information. Uh, Amy writes, in a forceful and epically transdisciplinary critique, Becker deconstructs the rationalist objectivist myths that undergird computing culture, demonstrating how they stand in the way of progress, sustainability, and justice. And on that note, I want to uh, turn it over to Professor Christoph Becker to share his insights and his expertise with us. Take it away, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who is joining us. I was very um, thrilled about that endorsement um, from Amy Co. And um, yeah, it's been, um, I think, epically transdisciplinary was the compliment I didn't know I wanted to hear. That was quite wonderful. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, as, as mentioned now, this talk is about my book, Insolvent, which releases in six days. Um, and uh, of course, my cat immediately claimed ownership of the print copies when they arrived last week. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping I can, I can hold on to my digital rights until he figures out my password. But um, some of you already have seen Knox, um, so figured I we should say hi. So, um, but on a more serious note, as the subtitle suggests, Insolvent is about reorienting tech, which implies that it's not headed in the right direction. And so I want to be blunt and brief about where we stand. So um, some years ago, the earth sciences have established nine clear boundaries that demarcate um, and establish a safe operating space for humanity. And every few months, some research comes out in various fields that um, revises our assessment of how our activities are standing with respect to these boundaries. And most of the time it's getting worse, um, although it doesn't have to get worse. And currently we breach at least six of these nine boundaries and climate change is one of them, as you can see on the upper left um, of this slide. The place that we currently call Canada or many call Canada is literally burning on both ends, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, millions of species on the planet are on a fast track to extinction. It is more likely than not that our planet will exceed the relatively, relatively safe threshold of one and a half degrees warming, not in 40 years, but in four, with a catastrophic three degrees to follow very soon. And uh, the IPCC this year made it very clear that our window of opportunity for a livable future is closing rapidly. So what we do now, what we do in the next seven years, will have impact for thousands. But that impact also begins immediately. And climate change is only one of the six planetary boundaries we're breaching. So because of that and related reasons, the UN Office for Disaster Risk um, already last year assessed that globally, the world is moving currently towards a scenario of global collapse because of the convergence of this ecological human cost destruction and societal disruption. So let's, let's keep in mind what is at stake here next time someone complains about 
climate activists being disruptive or someone says that indigenous land defenders are bad for the economy. And tech workers know that. Actually, today, half an hour ago, uh, a report was released that um, uh, about the, the state of green software. And it showed that 92% of tech workers and software professionals are concerned about climate change. So we need to make changes. We have to change things. I believe many of you agree we have to change things. Maybe that's why you're here as well. And many of us work in and with information technology or with computing. So naturally, we want to see how tech can help with that. And um, as Matt mentioned, I did most of my degrees in computer science. And while I joke that I'm still recovering from that, I also still love technology and computing. But to understand how tech can help with sustainability, we can't start with tech. We need to start with understanding sustainability. And sustainability, the capacity to endure, most importantly, the capacity of our planet and its ecosystems to endure, is complicated. And we can say that it's complicated or complex in a few ways. First, the subject is complex because we have to consider environmental aspects such as the safe planetary boundaries together with social factors, economic questions, technical decisions, and other aspects of technology design. Second, the social situation in which we do that is also complex because we're dealing with long-term global issues where collective action is needed and our individual influence is often fragmented and where some of us have much more influence than others. And third, it's ethically complex for a few reasons, but especially two. One is that people with different perspectives may not only disagree about facts and about values, but about how they interpret the world to begin with, and what kind of facts and what kinds of values matter to the situation and where, the, where to draw the boundary of discussions. And there's sometimes simply no common ground because they're in, between their positions, um, because these are incommensurable positions. And two, there is an asymmetry in how some people and other living beings are much more vulnerable than others. The past influences us and future generations, but we cannot influence the past. 385,000 babies are born today on the edge of an abyss, really, and they cannot hold us or our parents accountable for what we did yesterday to destroy their habitat. So the situation entails what is called asymmetric vulnerability. Those who live in a future of collapse can never reach back into the past to hold us responsible. Um, so as a technology, IT has some unique and wonderful properties, and you know many of these. I just want to highlight and illustrate them a little bit. Maybe most centrally and evidently, its capacities to store, retrieve, and analyze information and to support visualization, modeling, simulation can help us to analyze very complex questions in ways we could never do before. And because of such features, IT can also support us in this challenging leap from human and small group scales to environmental scales of thinking and action, both spatially and temporarily and socially. So um, just one simple example that is, is a homebrewn example is that platforms to collect, organize, and visualize or curate information like this one, which my team is building together with the Urban Governance Group in Montreal, can help us explore relationships between things like average income and climate risk, or between housing prices and bike lanes, or pollution and health, um, or like you see here, between the, so the relation between housing prices and the density of tree coverage. There's a myriad of other exciting tools, of course, from monitoring illegal fishing or logging via satellite imagery to international coordination or platform cooperatives. This and many other tools have almost endless possibilities to help us learn about our surroundings and how they're changing, to inform policymaking, to coordinate with each other, and to design and implement interventions for change. Um, one of IT's very popular roles, very central roles, is in improving efficiency. And in many sectors, IT can help us to decouple some economic activities from the environmental impact. And sometimes it can simultaneously increase equity. For example, a study showed that conducting global conferences online reduces the environmental impact by 99%, but it also enables all sorts of people to participate. In-person conferences exclude many, after all, whether it's for financial reasons or because their country of origin means that their visas get denied or they have care duties at home or they'd rather not participate in yet another super spreader event. Online conferencing enables more diverse and inclusive participation, including for people with disabilities like myself. 
And so this decoupling of material impact from social and economic activity, especially through efficiency gains, has been a really central focus area of a lot of work in IT that calls itself green IT. And that's often good, but we have to recognize that this decoupling is ultimately very limited and that many of these efficiency gains are often offset by a phenomenon called rebound effects. Basically, when we increase efficiency, the result very often is not reduced consumption, but increased productivity. A classic example is electric lighting. Light bulbs have become over a thousand times more efficient in the past century, but our use of them has increased over a thousand fold. We now use just as much energy per, per, per lighting per person than we used when our light bulbs needed a thousand times more energy than they do now. We don't do the same with less. We do more with the same. Our consumption rebounds. Um, and so for this and other reasons, this idea that we can keep expanding our economic activity and simply magically solve the problem of decoupling with technology is an absolute myth. There is no evidence that it will ever work. And of course, at the same time, tech itself is very much material and massively material. It's just one very, very contemporary receipt to remind us of how material the company that currently might gain most from so-called AI is the chip manufacturer NVIDIA, whose products power the large language models that so many people are now hyping. Yesterday, it became the first chip maker to reach a market cap of 1 trillion US dollars because everyone is buying those chips. And so who bears the material impact of excessive chip production? Just as with other impacts of climate change, it's disproportionately the world's poorest who bear the impact. For example, and focusing really just on that material aspect here, those who have the least access to these technologies are also the ones who carry most of the burden of electronic waste. They're the ones recycling the hazardous waste, and they're the ones who work in lithium mines, gold mines, and in the, in the picture on the right in the Indonesian tin mines shown. Just think about it for a moment. Everyone on this webinar right now with a Western education, comparably wealthy, high-tech supported, we're much more likely than the rest of the world to own Bitcoin or use ChatGPT. And simultaneously, we're much less likely to be affected by it than the majority of the planet. There is a huge imbalance here. Similarly, affluent business travelers who use downtown Airbnbs on short city trips are not typically the ones who are displaced by rising housing costs because they can afford it. And billionaires don't become homeless when forest fires destroy houses. So this is one reason or one way to look at it, why environmental sustainability is never just about the environment or about efficiency. It is always a question of equity and justice too. As um, Julian Agiman and others who coined the term just sustainability put it, a poor environment is not only a symptom of existing injustice, but rather a functioning environment provides us with the necessary conditions to achieve so uh, social justice. So the framing of just sustainability is serves as a reminder for us that the two are always entangled. So environmental sustainability cannot be treated as detached from social justice. And in the term just sustainability is the two meet. Or in the words, words of Jason Hickley, um, Hick, uh, justice is a key to solving the climate crisis. Um, and IT has a conflicted relationship to sustainability and justice. Now, many of us hold well, like hold high hopes for um, a technology supported transition to more sustainable and just societies. And in principle, computing can be a key to just sustainability. It can enable open information access. It can support webinars like this. It can enable sustainable lifestyles. And to some degree, it can support the partial decoupling of value creation through economic activity from material resource consumption. But in practice, as you will know, the opposite is more common. Everywhere on this planet, Tech drives environmental damage, increases the demand for resource extraction, reinforces inequality and injustice, and erodes privacy and democratic governance. So both the hopeful and the disastrous roles of IT are true at the same time. Many in tech now work on designing for sustainability and want to tackle questions of justice and fairness in computing, but their good intentions have not changed the overall trajectory of IT. On the contrary, we hear about the harmful effects of IT every day. And I call these harmful effects the depths of computing, the direct and indirect, often invisible harm that technology causes at a distance. And personally, I'm less focused on e-waste myself and more on how IT reconfigures 
our social and political relationships and how it reinforces and amplifies inequality, racism, ableism, and colonialism. Unfortunately, the harmful effects rarely afflict the designers. Instead, they're offshore, they're foisted on those who are far away. So the depths of computing are mounting and computing has externalized them. But still, like many of you, I believe I love technology and I love computing. It's just that right now it's really quite stuck and we need to change its direction. So when it comes to the complexity of the subject, the domain complexity, computing is actually very well suited to help. But how well equipped is it really to handle the social and the ethical complexity of just sustainability? Also, just sustainability brings the far away into focus. The effects of design choices are dispersed in time and place. Uh, Canadians' decision to invest in Bitcoin affects e-waste recyclers in a faraway place months later. Uh, one study actually calculated that each dollar of Bitcoin causes about a dollar of health damages in the US and China alone. The decisions of travelers to use Airbnb has um, enabled behavioral shifts in investors. Those two have reinforced each other and significantly worsened the urban housing crisis in Toronto and in many other cities. But the, the social and temporal distance between the design choices and their far-reaching effects often hides these harms. And, and it, it entails uncertainties, so probabilistic um, uh, uncertainty, and it also causes ambiguity. We're not sure how uncertain it is. And it comes with asymmetric power. Those who are alive today, especially those with power, hold that power asymmetrically over the poor, over non-human nature, and over the future. And those who are affected by technology development often have little means of influencing the design decisions. And in the case of future generations, they have no way to hold us accountable. And so one might say that these distant stakeholders carry the debts of computing. And so because of this asymmetric vulnerability, the deepest challenge of just sustainability is not technical and it's not scientific and it's not even economic, it is ethical. What matters most is what we do to protect those who are vulnerable to our actions and unable to hold us accountable, especially the global poor, future generations and non-human nature. And because the harms are dispersed temporally and spatially, because the vulnerability to these harms is always asymmetric, it's very easy for anyone who designs to disregard the debts that the choices incur. Economically, that's because the debts are paid by others. Cognitively, they seem far away. And ethically, those who design are typically privileged and biased in our own favor. As Gardiner writes, our position is not that of neutral observers, but we're judges in our own case, and there's no one to properly hold us accountable. And so that creates a moral hazard that we have to account for when we design. And this is why just sustainability really challenges how we think about technology. Designing for just sustainability asks us to reflect on how we think about technology and its role in our societies, and it puts center stage the importance of a systemic understanding that always views technical systems in their social, ecological, cultural context and history. It's now quite widely acknowledged there is a mutual relationship between technologies and social life. We know that scientific and technological artifacts are social constructions, and we know that the social relationships that result in what we call society are mediated and configured by technology. Just a quick example, the technology of this webinar right now configures who can see what, who is heard, and who can contact whom. And of course, it is also the product of a historical trajectory of development of broadcasting, online video, and the result of many design, development, and configuration choices that were made in the production and installation and use of this system. So if we design for just sustainability, we need to understand both at the same time. We need to understand how technologies are social and how modern societies are technological. So we have to combine the conversation about how computing shapes our lives with a close and critical look at how it comes to life. And so is the tech world ready? Unfortunately, I believe that in its current dominant form, it is not. And I would say that I, I kind of have learned this in three different ways. From a, a personal perspective, my own computer science education and my industry experience not only didn't prepare me for this, it made it more difficult for me to see what was really going on. It, narrowed my view by equipping me with a set of beliefs and metaphors that structured my thinking and that really distorted what I could talk about. It gave me this false sense that working on sustainability means basically 
to solve the difficult problems of sustainability with a rational science-based approach to designing and engineering technology. One problem at a time, we get closer to a sustainable world. That's the, the story. It took me quite a long time to climb outside that box that my education and experience put me in so I could see how limited that view was. And it took a lot of reading, so that's number two. And third, in practice, I've seen time and again that very smart people around me with the very best intentions struggle to find a perspective and direction for their work that is genuinely conducive to just sustainability. Here's how Dr. Timnit Gebru, um, the co-founder of the Diversity and AI Research Institute puts it. The hardest thing to change is the cultural attitude of scientists. Scientists like her and like me, we're some of the most dangerous people in the world because we have this illusion of objectivity, the illusion of meritocracy and the illusion of searching for objective truth. I think that's very well put. And so after a few years reading deeply into areas like sustainability sciences, critical social theory, history and philosophy of technology, systems thinking and psychology, I, I think I began to understand why computing is so stuck. And I'm, I'm focused here on the way of thinking, not the structural conditions of capitalism, to put it like that. And when we focus on our way of thinking, then put very simply, computing is stuck in ill-conceived assumptions about the nature of problems, the workings of the human mind, the history and politics of technology, and what it really means to design. And to be clear, this is of course true for other tech spaces too. And at the same time, it's not equally true for everyone in every field in computing or in tech. There's a huge amount of variety um, it is, however, largely true for what we might call the mainstream, the dominant orthodox view of technology. And so in Solvent, I, quen I spent quite a bit of um, space introducing these myths of computing. Basically, one way to see it is that myths are widespread but fl flawed beliefs, but they're also important foundational stories that give cultural meaning to our world and they shape how we talk about it. And in, in tech, we talk about the world largely based on a mythology or ideology that evacuates history and politics from design and creates this illusion of a neutral scientific technical rationality, kind of a calm cockpit from which technology steered to a better future, one solved problem at a time. And as coherent and natural as it appears, it is an illusion. And that illusion hides the collateral damage and suffering that it produces. So let's just briefly look into the simplest of these myths, the idea that technology is value neutral. So the story says that because facts are distant from values, distinct from values, science and technology are really only about facts. And when we produce facts and artifacts, we should not put our values into them. In fact, we can't actually do that because technology doesn't really have values. There's no place for it. It's a very common story, maybe less common for many of you because we teach quite a few courses showing that this is a false story. But um, here's just one simple illustration of just how false. Software systems and algorithms are never truly neutral. On the contrary, designers and organizations have values and embody values and their design choices enable and embed specific values in the systems through the features and the qualities they construct. And algorithms and software systems in turn express and enact these values through the behaviors and affordances. Brady Butch put it very nicely that every line of code represents a moral decision Every bit of data collected, analyzed, and visualized has moral implications. And only some of these implications are immediately obvious. So, for example, here, selecting a Boolean as the type for the gender variable is a choice, and it's not a neutral choice. It embeds the conservative value of binary gender stereotypes into the material artifact of code, and it will inevitably lead to situations in which a person who does not conform to the stereotype will experience its torque. Airport body scanners, for example, tend to flag trans peoples as suspicious, as Costanza Chok explains so well in Design Justice. But the opposite, to choose not a Boolean, but a more appropriate type for the variable, or to refrain from collecting data about gender, which we could do, that's not a neutral choice either, because that explicitly considers the value of gender-sensitive technology design, and it enacts it in code. There is no neutral ground here. Every choice we make turns values into facts. But the myth of value-neutral technology hides that by diminishing the role that values play in determining the shape of technological artifacts. As Feinberg put it, values are not the opposite of facts. Values are the facts of the future. 
And so technology shapes social reality through its functions and affordances and effects. So its values have significant reach. And because they're expressed in technological artifacts that result from designers' choices, technology designers and developers and owners cannot evade moral responsibility. So there are many layers to this argument, um, and we need to look closely at how values become facts. And beyond that, we need to figure out how we can bypass the gravity wells, so to say, of the other myths too. And so put very briefly, these other myths tell us that the human mind is basically a flawed computer. It doesn't work very well, but we should think of it as a computer that is a little broken. Um, they tell us that problems are real things that exist and that we can discover them using scientific methods. And they tell us that design is basically problem solving. And those act like currents or undercurrents that create an undertow that prevents us from reaching just sustainability. And it's these myths taken together that uh, cause computing to be insolvent, to be unable to pay back the debts it owes to the planet. Now, the consequences of these myths are very subtle, but the ultimate consequences are far reaching and quite devastating. So insolvency in business can be met in two ways, bankruptcy or restructuring. And I'm suggesting not bankruptcy, but I'm suggesting that we restructure and reorganize and reorient the tech world. And to do that, we need to deconstruct these myths and replace them with more nuanced stories. And if we want to work on this, we need to consider that computing can help us with domain complexity and it can help us with social coordination, for example, but it is really not equipped itself to handle ethical complexity. Because the myths of computing prevent meaningful change, we need to face them and we also need to work around them. The good news is that we can do that, we can work it out. In conjunction with other fields, computing and IT can figure out how to get out from this undertow and how to learn to play an important and genuinely helpful role. I think the stakes are very high, the task is very urgent. The entire argument, of course, is very complex, so I, I'm simplifying a lot here today to make my point. But um, I should also note that IT and computing already contain many pockets of critical and divergent perspectives that are hard at work at overcoming this impasse. It's just that the computing mainstream, to put it like that, is not there yet. But more and more people in the tech world are waking up and realize this is not good enough. Now, those who can help best often come from critical and feminist perspectives in fields like sociology, the humanities, philosophy, and other fields. And I like to call these researchers and fields the critical friends of computing. But basically, a critical friend brings us support and respect to the table, but enough distance to challenge us. And you could say that critical friends are the friends who tell us what no one else dares to tell us. They critique because they care. And, and so do I, really. Um, critique can make us uncomfortable. And that really is the starting point for learning to change. But it takes two to form a critical friendship. You ha we have to listen to our critical friends. Now, some communities in tech and in computing have long cultivated very constructive relationships with the critical friends. Uh, so, for example, much of the work on critical design methods draws from intersectional feminist theory and from science and technology studies. So we don't have the time here to talk through this deep history and details of each of the critical friends. Um, but I want to highlight the importance of taking a critical approach. Essentially, critical theory helps us demonstrate how existing arrangements can look more inevitable than they are. And that opens up a path for change. And the point is not to give up on technical approaches and to cri criticize them into the ground, but to place critical uh, technical approaches within a critically aware social framework so they can be ethical and useful at the same time. So I was fortunate enough to develop some of these critical friendships with a few fields, and each of them has insights to offer that help us overcome some of these myths. For example, critical systems thinking helps us reflect on the assumptions and the boundaries of technical approaches so we can embed them within an appropriate ethical frame. Um, or feminist science and technology studies has helped the community I'm a part of to perform a deconstructive exercise that allowed us or helped us to recognize hidden values and assumptions of our field and of our community and analyze our own political circumstances as members of that community. And it has a lot more to offer. And maybe finally here, judgment and decision-making, especially in this naturalistic tradition, helped me recognize some profound misunderstandings in how we humans really make choices, including in technology design, 
and to correct some misinterpretations of behavioral decision making research, especially on intertemporal choices in systems design, which are fundamental to sustainability. Yes, there are, there's various cultural references in there. Um, and so building these critical friendships, I've sometimes felt a bit like that turtle. The, the task seems enormous, but it's also really delicious. <laughs> so sometimes you have to get through the bitter end first. Um, so, and this kind of work is already happening and it is really transforming computing and technology from the inside as well, opening new horizons. And I think that kind of work is a very promising path for genuine change. It's difficult, but really worthwhile. And I believe the transformative change that we need cannot really happen without these difficult renewals and, and that grappling. So we already have many of the correctives to the current misery. We know that sustainability and justice are always political and technical, they're social and ecological at the same time. And the solutionism that now dominates the tech world really reinforces the inequitable status quo, but misperceives and misrepresents itself as a force of sustainable progress. The path to just sustainability begins with setting this paradigm aside and looking for other angles. And these angles begin with critique, with reflection, and especially for me, with systemic thought. And doing that shows us that technology is never neutral. So we need to consider how values shape it and whose values get expressed in it. It shows us that the human mind is actually capable of amazing things. It's capable of reflection, of judgment, of empathy, of foresight, and much more. So we need to consider how to amplify our abilities to think long-term and collectively. It also shows us that problems don't actually exist. Problems are socially constructed frames that we use to make sense of difficult situations so we can figure out what to do. So we need to pay close attention to what happens there, to the politics and the ethics and the social process of defining problems. And it reminds us that design can be much more than problem solving. The problem framing is, is uh, more foundational maybe. And so we need to incorporate that in our work. So um, let me... Um, Begin to wrap up here. Um, is computing ready for just sustainability? I don't think so, but it can get ready. We know that the planet is burning. We need to transform our societies, we really do, to achieve sustainability and justice. We know that the two are entangled. We need to address them together. And in technology and design and computing, we also can only address them together. So just sustainability is urge us to center the implications of design choices on distant stakeholders who have little to no influence. Currently, IT has a really conflicted relationship with just sustainability. In principle, it has significant potential for enabling transformative change. Its pervasive nature as a general purpose technology also makes it an enabler of many other technologies. It can help us understand complex issues and coordinate globally, for example, to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable. But its current form is really tied up with the fossil fuel industry and it's captive to an ideology that cannot recognize its political and its social basis. And that very often leads it astray. So we need a different approach to get out of this situation. And in partnership with Critical Friends, we can hope to achieve that transformative change that we need to turn computing and IT into a force for just sustainability. So insolvent is the story of how computing got stuck and how the Critical Friends can help it become unstuck. Actually, unstuck was my working title for a while. Uh, and so engaging with these critical friends can be uncomfortable and it's not always easy. But I promise if you're willing to do that, you'll find new perspectives on how to work with tech and how to make tech work, not just for billionaires, but for everyone. And of course, all of this is um, explained in extensive detail in the book. So I hope you take the time to read it and uh, please let me know what you think. Thank you very much for listening. Terrific! That's an that was an amazing talk, Christophe. I have to say, I I uh, you should see my my desk here. I didn't have sufficient. Oh, I can't. It's blurred out. I didn't have sufficient paper, so I was scrolling little notes all over various pieces of paper about the the, the wonderful things you were we were speaking about. Um, I see that we've already received a question from the chat and I think you're gonna like, I think you'll find this an interesting question. It's from Gerald. Uh, and so we're gonna jump right into some questions. 
Um, the question, the first question is from Gerald and he asks, um, he, uh, this is what he says. He says, I just asked chat GPT how to create just sustainable computing. And it responded with 10 steps, one of which is circular economy. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> yes, um, I have some, some thoughts, maybe I'll, um, Stop sharing my slides for now. Uh, so ChatGPT does not understand any of this, of course. ChatGPT is a large language model, which is essentially, as some have pointed out, the giant spreadsheet. Um, it's only a small simplification. Um, it, it, generates, it generates whatever words are most likely to follow the words that you put in last. And so if you mention sustainability, and especially maybe if you mention something around just, it is most likely to follow up with whatever blurbs come that are most frequently mentioned in publicly available texts that talk about sustainability and mention justice. So the circular economy is, of course, an important component in the necessary reorganization of our societies. There is nothing wrong with mentioning that, um, but um, any Google search would probably have uh, given you similar ideas uh, with actually peer-reviewed articles that um, talk in informed and understanding ways about what that actually means. And um, if you follow up asking ChatGPT to tell you some references to look up, you will, as you very likely know, uh, find out that those references don't actually exist because they're simply <laughs> generated text that sounds plausible, but has nothing to do with understanding any of this. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I in, in Insolvent in the book, actually, at the end, I kind of open up the conversation further into the context of what changes are underfoot outside of computing. And one of the one of the massive and really really important ideas, and I believe the most important idea um, to figure out for the next um, time, is essentially that we cannot keep expanding our economic activity uh, with beyond planetary safe boundaries um, indiscriminately or at all. Um, endless accumulative compound economic growth is fundamentally incompatible with the fact that we live on a finite planet. And so the idea of economic growth itself is ultimately at the bottom of, um, of a lot of our challenges and, and reorganizations. And circular economy is one of the approaches that shifts the idea um, and that shifts that. Uh, but I would, I would suggest uh, some, I can happily suggest some of the references in, in Solvent at the end for some excellent reading on ideas on how to make that happen. Um, and I I'd recommend that over ChatGPT. That's great. Thank you so much, Christoph. Another question, uh, uh, this time from an anonymous attendee, what inspired you to explore the intersection of computing, sustainability, and justice in your book? What caused you to, uh, I'm adding to the question here, but what caused you to focus your attention on, on this, uh, this intersection? Thank you. Um, yeah, this, um, I, I do talk about this in the introduction as well. It was a bit of a, a serendipitous path my my doctoral research was about sustainability of digital information objects, software dependent objects like cultural heritage objects in libraries and archives that need to be sustained over the long term. And at some point, I really wanted to shift the perspective. We were always coming in late, uh, reactively after things have become obsolete, obsolete to help archivists and and other custodians to figure out how to preserve something. And I wanted to shift the attention earlier in the life, in the life cycle of systems design to figure out how to address that upfront. And, uh, and initially I called that longevity engineering. And then at some point I realized how narrow that view was and how limited that was and I shifted to sustainability design. And, um, and so at that point I started realizing how, re how sort of that is, related to and overlapping with the concerns of many other people also concerned with long-term effects of systems design and how these other effects of systems design are ultimately maybe more important or more urgent to, to look at and how we can't really disentangle those questions. And so I became very interested in designing for sustainability and reading into sustainability sciences and, and other spaces, I came to recognize how um, how problematic it is to talk about environmental sustainability as if it was not a justice issue. Mm -hmm. It is an extremely unjust thing, and um, a lot of harm has been done by by work on things like green computing and and related projects that ultimately um, simply reinforced colonial 
sustainable development narratives and and reinforced inequality and and other problematic issues uh, reinforced colonialism and by reframing that into just sustainabilities and climate justice and related concerns we can't really do that it kind of closes that possibility we we, we can't so easily create that accidental harm if we recognize right from the outset the framing of just sustainability so that's kind of how i ended there serendipitous, serendipitously that's that's a wonderful that's a wonderful intellectual journey and i think one that a lot of not not a lot but more and more people uh, are following a similar kind of a, a path as they realize the inter interconnectivity and i'm sure your book is going to help people make those connections even um even further uh we have lots of questions so um Hopefully there'll be time for me to ask my biting question that I that I set up, but uh, maybe there won't. We'll we'll find out. You'll find out. Um, there's a great question from Wei that says uh, that asks about the content of the book. Uh, they write, "Thank you for your excellent speech, Dr. Becker. I have no tech background, but was trained as a social scientist. Would I be able to understand the book? Also, one step further, would I be prepared to do research on the intersection of tech and social justice slash?" social governance. Great question about the readability of the book. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. It is an excellent question. Um, I think um, absolutely, yes, I would I would say you're, you should be able to understand the book. Um, it, it might actually be slightly easier if you have the social theory background, but not the technology background, as opposed to having purely a computer science background and no social theory background. Because it is quite philosophical, it goes deeply into social theory and kind of distill some of the really important ideas to bring it in dialogue with computing as critical friends. And so you'll be more familiar with terms like dereification or, or others. Um, and so, so I think uh, it, it should definitely be um, helpful. And oh, now the question disappeared, but there was a second part that I wanted um, to- They were asking about- Yeah, yeah so- um, so I think there, you sh you, there are many paths to do research on the intersection of tech and social justice, social governance, and um, I'm, I would definitely encourage you to, to find a, a meaningful um, role there, and there are many meaningful roles. Uh, it is useful, there's always this spectrum, and I find it useful for me often to have some computing background, some technological understanding of algorithms, for example, if only sometimes to kind of know the areas kind of to, to kind of articulate the, the relationship between the technical aspects and the social aspects so I can then figure out well, how the social aspects work. Um, but there's always this, this spectrum of co combined expertise and there are many ways to, to combine expertise and to develop enough expertise on kind of the other space, the other side of that spectrum to put it like that. And so I would look forward to your research on that intersection. I'm also really happy to talk to anyone who wants to have a chat about these intersections. I think they're extremely important. And if I can be of any help, I would be very delighted to be of help. Make myself- no, That's, that, that's uh, a great answer. And maybe just to, to add very quickly, um, essentially it's for two audiences. It's for those in computing who are concerned about sustainability and or justice and who want to figure out what they can do. And it's for those outside of the technical fields, such as information people, uh, information professionals, um, SDS scholars, who want to find meaningful ways to collaborate with the more technical spaces. So it's it's very much written for those two audiences. Yeah, that's a, I mean, and, and such a such a needed, such a necessary um, aspect uh, of that. Um, so maybe I'll take this opportunity to ask my hard biting question, which really speaks to that intersection. Um, and it and it's, you know, it, and you know this, but it, it's, it speaks to the, I'd like to hear you think about, you know, the fact that there have been people doing work on the sort of, imaginary objectivity of science and technology for hundreds of years from fields like philosophy and history and anthropology and sociology. And for the last 50 years, specifically focusing on um, the, the, the very similar problematic aspects that you note around, um, uh, around the technological and around computing, the value neutrality, the instrumentality, you know, those, those aspects. But, but that work seems to have not had a dramatic impact on the sort of operations of computing. Um, and, and I'm thinking here also of the work of people that you know, like Andrew Feinberg, who's been publishing work on this topic since the 1970s. So, you know, what does your work do differently? What do you bring to the table that uh, has the possibility to have a larger impact on specifically the computing mainstream? 
than some of the scholars that you probably cite in your book? That is a, a very good question, a very hard question as well. Um, so yes, of course, I cite Andrew Finberg very much in the book. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, there, there are multiple rabbit holes here, and I'll try not to go into more than one. But the there have been the, the the discussion of value neutrality has been happening in multiple parallel fields that, for some strange reasons that I still don't fully understand, that never talk to each other. And so, for example, feminist and, and science and technology studies talked about it um, for, for decades. And at the same time, in a field called critical systems thinking, that very similar conversation was also happening with a completely different vocabulary. Although there was there were a couple of joint references, including um, the critical theory of the Frankfurt School and Foucault and, um, and Haraway was also cited by the critical systems thinkers. But there was not a lot of um, working together on that, or almost none. Um, and so both of these have found different ways to talk about this. And I would say that the to put it in a simplified manner, some parts reacted more strongly as this is all terrible. We need to start from a completely new ground. Um, uh, and um, and the, the critical systems thinkers more directly grappled with this confrontation and tried to be critical friends of the more, more science-oriented um, uh, mainstream, let's put it like that. And they, 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 ha they developed some amazing ways to work with that, and they stayed closer to the way of talking that was more common. And um, I would say there is a complex and nuanced history of how much they have achieved, but they, they were able to develop more specific concrete practices that were simultaneously technical and critical in the way that Agri was also looking for in the 90s in the in the AI field. And, and so I think that is one, I, I'm building very much on this angle, and I do believe that this has a lot to, taught, to teach us, because they very directly confronted these very foundational tensions. Uh, for example, we want to be holistic, we want to make sure we understand the full impact. So we need global climate models, for example. But at the same time, we can never be completely comprehensible. Comprehensive, we can never include everything. So the real question is, where do we draw the boundary? How do we draw the boundary? And I believe in some fields that question was kind of shied away from. And in critical systems thinking, that is the foundational question. How do we justify drawing any boundary? On what assumptions do we draw these boundaries? And how do we reflect on these assumptions? And it has developed some very concrete heuristics and questions and ways to talk about this that um, and allow us to embed technical work in a socially critically appreciative frame. Some of that is a bit complex, um, which is one reason why the book is a little long, but uh, I hope that I have, I've been able to translate some of that and reinterpret some of that for today's audience. That's and great. This, is not a, this is not an either or, but really uh, doing everything at the same time. There's a lot of amazing work in value sensitive design that is all represented in the book as well. Um, but and then there are some ways of thinking about how we can combine the existing work on value sensitive design with this more critically reflective frame. Right, that's great. Thank you so much, Christoph. That's uh, that's great to hear. Um, um, I think we have time for a couple more questions, um, at least one more, and it's from Monica Iqbal, and she asks, which I think is a great question. She says, "Thanks, Christoph, for an amazing talk." Is, is it worth doing a PhD in the intersection of computer science and sustainability? I'm still deciding if I should do one after completing my master of information degree. Christoph, what do you think? What should she do a PhD? Uh, of course, you should probably do a PhD <laughs> of information, maybe not computer science. You might want to do it in our faculty. Um, um, I, there is so much to do, and uh, and I believe, especially if you take this critically reflective approach and make sure not to inadvertently just cause more harm, then of course it's a good idea. I, I would say it would be a bad idea if you want to just solve some sustainability problems. Hmm. Um, I mean, yes, of course, there are still also sustainability problems to be solved, but if we just focus on that too narrowly, that there is a lot of harm that, that follows from that very often. So absolutely, yes, please. I, I'd be happy to chat anytime. That's great. Um, I'll maybe I'll just ask one more question, one more broad question, um, and that is, um, uh, it's very broad. It gives you a chance to read the conclusion of your book, maybe. Um, and it is, uh, do you believe that computing actually has the potential to drive meaningful change in achieving sustainability and justice? 
And if so, uh, how can we, what is the best way for us to harness this potential effectively? Also a great question. Yes, um, I would I would maybe focus in on that verb drive and I would be, uh, I'm going to be a little blunt and say in its current form to drive change, absolutely not. In its mm -hmm. current form, because it is insolvent, because it is incapable of reflecting on, on, on its social and political context, computing is not doing that. But does computing have the potential to help us drive meaningful change? Absolutely. It has enormous possibilities. It can help us with global coordination, it already helps us with monitoring illegal activities. It can help us hold the fossil fuel industry accountable. It can have beautiful outcomes, but it's it, it needs to be somewhat reoriented away from that current mainstream. It needs to be taken out of, well, put bluntly, billionaire tech bros, uh, and uh, it needs to be under a, a social democratic control and ownership of, of the people who, affect, who it affects in the end. Um, and so I'm very excited about, uh, for example, models of platform cooperatives, uh, cooperatively owned organizations. I'm really excited about some of the work um, in, um, for example, in Barcelona on the circular economy uh, related to the degrowth uh, research and development network. There is some really exciting work. There's also a workshop in two weeks from now called Computing Within Limits that I have the pleasure of, of being a little bit involved in organizing that has been providing a platform for some of these more critical, progressive um, and and very very sensitive and informed uh, conversations about where to go and how to develop a computing that helps us live within safe planetary boundaries and and thrive as human societies. And um, there, you that is also free and online, and you're very welcome to join and see some of the conversations that are happening. And a lot of this is happening. A lot of that reorientation. Um, it's not that I propose in a book that we uh, that. We need all these new things. And also very much it's about things that have already been begun by many others. Um, so fortunately, there is a, a big momentum for that, I believe. That's a great that's a great way to end uh, on, a, on a hopeful note uh, that uh, the, the, the themes and ideas of the book and some of the uh, hopeful predictions in your book will actually come true. So um, I want to thank you for uh, a wonderful talk and for a wonderful uh, set of questions from the audience. And I'm going to pass it back to Claudia for some closing statements. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Becker. Thank you. And I would first like to express my gratitude to both Professor Becker for delivering such an engaging presentation on this topic and Professor Rado for skillfully moderating our discussion today. I also want to extend my thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Professor Becker's research on the impact of computing on our pursuit for sustainability and justice was deeply insightful, and I am certain that all of us here are eagerly anticipating the release of his book. It has garnered endorsement from prominent authors and professors, signaling its potential to provide novel pathways for researchers and professionals alike. In the chat window is a link to a feedback survey, which we will also be sending to you by email in the coming days. We highly encourage you to respond before June 16th, as it presents a fantastic opportunity to win a copy of Professor Becker's new book. Through the survey, you can also express your interest to stay connected and get involved with the Faculty of Information. I would also like to extend a special invitation to our alumni to attend two upcoming events during alumni reunion. Firstly, we have an alumni breakfast taking place at Massey College this Saturday. And secondly, the Faculty of Information Alumni Association is hosting their spring soiree tomorrow evening. We would be thrilled to have you join us for these memorable occasions, details of which are available on your screen. With that, we come to the end of our event. I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day and a happy alumni reunion. Thank you.